Jane. That's a tough act to follow. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Church of Chapel Hill. We're so glad you're here to worship the Lord with us this morning. Uh, thank you for being a part of the service. I've got quite a few announcements, and I want to go rather quickly so I can do something unique at the end of this. So would you, uh, would you recite the memory verse with me? Here we go. Now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you will have your fruit to holiness in the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I have a handwritten note here that just says, choir, sign up. So make sure you sign up, choir people. There is a sign-up sheet, I believe, at the Connection Center, and you can always find Miss Stacy, and she will put you to work in the choir as we have several big events coming up where we will need the choir. Um, so please sign up if you're interested. Um, you don't have to be a soloist. You can just blend into the crowd, and uh, we'll put you to work. The next one is regarding Tacos and Targets, which is a men's fusion event, which will be next Saturday. I guess it would technically be this coming Saturday at 1 p.m. at the Nelsons. You can see their address on there. If you have any questions, you can ask Pastor John, myself, or if you know the Nelsons, you can ask them, and they will get those questions answered for you. Next slide. Reminder that next Sunday will also be a special Sunday in the life of our church as Pastor Bruce Aubrey will be here. Uh, this is a man who has poured into our senior pastor, Pastor John, so it'll be exciting to hear him preach a message here at the church at Chapel Hill. Next slide. Fall Festival is coming up. There's all kinds of notes on here, but the biggest one I want to point out is we need many, many volunteers. Was it two weeks ago I preached and I talked about the Hebrew emphasis when you put the word more than once, like holy, holy, holy. We need many, many, many <laughs> volunteers. The great thing about volunteering for this is you are volunteering for a one-hour shift. You do not have to volunteer for the whole time. Just one hour. Just one hour. At the end of service today, my wife, Kristen, is going to be standing over there at the Connection Center to sign you up. So again, we're just asking for one hour of your time. I've mentioned numerous times that this is one of the biggest outreaches we do for the community. We've got, you know, Big Blue here. We've got all kinds of events, the radio. So we want to share the love of Christ with our community. So please sign up for a one-hour shift, and um, we can just make that a blessed evening. The last thing I wanted to talk about is regarding Pastor John's messages. So last week he preached a, a pretty pronounced message on the reality of hell. And it was, a, it was a biblical excellent message. And today, as you can see from the first song, we're going to switch that up completely and we're going to talk about the reality of heaven, which is obviously where we all want to end up. But he and I were talking this morning about some people that, oftentimes are in that last moment with individuals as they are about to either transition or they're going to transition from this life into the next. And the reality is they're going to be in one of those two places that he's talked about. They're either going to be in hell, which he talked about last week, or they're going to be in heaven. And the people that are normally with them in those situations are our healthcare workers. And we have many of those people in our church. So I wanted to take a moment and ask anyone who works in the healthcare industry to stand up and be recognized. So could you do that, please, if you work in healthcare? Thank you. And I also want to challenge those people that work in healthcare before I give up the mic. Man, shouldn't have given it to me this morning. That if you are in those situations where a person may be transitioning from this world to the next, be bold. You might be that person that shares the truth of Scripture for that hundredth time, but it sinks in as they're about to pass from this world to the next. So I want to implore you. 
to share the gospel if you're in those situations. And you say, well, I may get in trouble at work. Who cares if you save a soul? Who cares? It could be like the thief on the cross and you're the one that shares the love of God for that hundredth time. And therefore they spend an eternity in heaven. So I want to go to the Lord in prayer. I want to pray for Pastor John's message. I want to pray for the offering. And I want to pray for our healthcare workers who are oftentimes with people in the last moments of their lives. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we are just so grateful for the reality of heaven, Lord. Your word speaks about heaven. Your word makes promises to us about heaven. But the best part about heaven is you're there. You are seated on the throne, high and lifted up, and we get to spend eternity with you if we have surrendered our lives to you. Father, I pray that you will be with Pastor John as he preaches about the reality of heaven this week. Last week, he shared a stirring message about the realities of hell, and you speak about that in your word dozens and dozens of times, Lord. So be with Pastor John as he really shares the good news with us today. Father, be with the offering. Use it to magnify your name and to bring glory to your name. And Father, be with these people that are involved in the healthcare industry. Lord, as they may be with someone who's about to pass from this world to the next, Lord, give them boldness to share the gospel that one last time, Lord. They may be the reason that someone spends an eternity in heaven if they're bold enough to share your love for them. Father, we pray all of this in the powerful, holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face, he who died and rose. Again. Holy, holy is the Lord And every prayer we prayed in desperation The songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear In the end we see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears Oh, there will be a day when all will bow before him There will be a day when death will be no more Standing face to face He who died and rose again Holy, holy And beside the heroes of the faith With one voice a thousand generations Sing worthy is the Lamb who slain On that day we join the resurrection Stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice, a thousand generations, and worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Forever He shall raise. Let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven, with angels face to face. We raise a mighty roar, glory to our God. Who gave his life beyond the grave Holy, holy is the Lord Let it be today We shout 
the hymn of heaven With angels sing the saints We raise a mighty roar Glory to our God Who gave us life beyond the grave Holy, holy is the Lord Holy, holy is the Lord Will you stand again with us to sing? As we've said, the theme today is heaven. And just as we were preparing on Thursday, especially when we were singing this song, I was just just given that glimpse of heaven, those little bits that we get to see while we're here. And um, we're, we're just so excited for that option, that there's just a hope and as I have said several times with the praise team that here we might look hopeless. Here it might seem like there's just nothing but devastation and loss. But yet we have a hope. We have a peace. We have a joy. And we can fix our eyes on the one who is worthy and the one who is holy. So let's sing together. is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy King of kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you.
is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss our kids, ages 4 through 12, to their classes, and ages 3 and under to the nursery. And we're going to continue to sing how holy He is just how worthy he is. So lift up your voices as we sing. scriptures, I just want to say, and for those of you who are also involved in the praise team who are not singing today, would you, would you stand just for a moment? Uh, those who swap Sundays, listen, folks, today, I just want to say how grateful I am for all of the investment of time throughout the days, the weeks, the months, the years. I just want to encourage you and for us to express gratitude that the music, not just today, not just last Sunday, but Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we are very, very blessed. And I'd like for you to generously thank these people for their, their time. Thank you. <laughs> last Sunday, I was so helped and encouraged by the music, and this Sunday was uh, no exception. So, very, very thankful. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Revelation chapter 4. Uh, the, the message last Sunday, as Pastor Gary already mentioned, was heavy on my heart, and I was just uh, I felt like I needed to get right in without any, any pauses or breaks or, or to shift the focus. So I didn't even say thank you to Pastor Gary last Sunday for preaching while we were away. We had a wonderful time with uh, our family celebrating my parents' 50th uh, wedding anniversary a couple of Sundays ago. And Gary preached for uh, our church. And so thankful for Pastor Gary and for just his faithfulness and uh, the blessing that it is to be able to have people you can trust that uh, fill the pulpit. And uh, he's preaching more and more as the years go on, and I'm grateful for that. And I always just get good reports from you um, of how grateful you are for his preaching. Um, I'm really glad for that. And uh, I, want to, I want to have confidence in the Lord that not only he has raised up here, but my heart is not to 
to ask somebody to preach who I think is maybe a step or two uh, not as far along in their preaching as I am. I don't mean that as like, a, but, but you know, somebody who's new to preaching or, or younger uh, in order to try to make myself feel better of insecurity when I leave. Uh, I, want, I want people to preach that are um, capable, able, gifted, and who God has ordained and raised up. And so I praise the Lord, my heart, and I've told Gary this before, and I really mean this, I want Gary to do better and, and the best he's ever done every time he preaches. And um, it's not harder to do much better than me, but, but I just want you to know my heart is that when we have people stand in this place, this is not my church, this is not our church, this is the Lord's church. And so I'm excited about next Sunday because uh, a mentor, a brother, a friend who has been so dear to me, I'm looking forward and he's, uh, he's wonderful. He's got a lot more training, got masters, doctorates, all of those things. But I'm just thankful for uh, the men that the Lord has raised up to be able to preach here. And uh, so thank you, Pastor Gary. Also, I want to say uh, this coming Tuesday will be... My wife and I's 19th wedding anniversary. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, for Carrie and for our marriage and God's blessing upon it. And we uh, slipped up to Lake Erie for overnight on Friday and took a little boat ride with some ch a church family that's got a, got a boat. And they took us over to one of the little islands up there and we went spelunking. We went in a cave, couple of caves and uh, saw some crystals and... Um, and it was a blessing, but I'm thankful for you. You have, you have um, my my mom, who who was uh, the founding pastor's wife. My dad of this church was a was a wonderful and is a wonderful pastor's wife. But I'm grateful that the standard and the the gifting and the uh, the heart for God's people did not take any uh, dive or detraction or deficit when Carrie uh, stepped into that role. You have a wonderful pastor's wife, and so I'm very grateful. So just, just thankful today on a lot of points, and uh, my message is not going to be short, so we better get jumping in here, okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 1. Last Sunday, I preached on the subject of hell. And if you want to fully understand and and hopefully be blessed by today's message, I strongly urge you to listen to last week's sermon if you have not, because if you don't understand the reality and the horrors of hell, you cannot appreciate and understand the reality and the glories of heaven. Uh, today, I am, as last Sunday, I'm not going to fully satisfy your, all your curiosities and answer all your questions about heaven. One of the most intimidating um, experiences of my life in preaching has been studying on these two subjects because I know that we are limited in our uh, full understanding of these topics and yet they're in God's Word, they're real, we need to understand as best we can and so um, I just pray that, that there will be multiple but uh, at least a few things today that you will be encouraged by on the subject of heaven. Uh, Adrian Rogers said this, most people don't care about heaven and hell. They just want to know how to hack it on Monday. And that is true. We live in such a consumeristic, materialistic, uh, just uh, right now, live in the moment society um, that, that we don't allow uh, our minds and our hearts to contemplate and pause and think and consider and deal with the subjects of eternity. Uh, but man, the Bible sure do, does, and we need to make sure that we're faithful to preach, not just the cherry pick the verses that, that we like, but be faithful to preach the whole counsel of God as Paul instructs us to do. So would you stand please and let's give a reverence and honor to God's word. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. This is entitled, The Throne Room of Heaven. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. Where's heaven? It's up. And I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one, only one, sat on the throne. 
And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne. Not a half rainbow, a full rainbow. A rainbow around the throne in an appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on those thrones I, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was the sea of, a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. We've never seen anything like that. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's read that together. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created and all of the redeemed of the Lord said, Amen. Now, one more. I want you to turn to Revelation 21. And we'll read a few more descriptions of heaven before we pray. Now, I saw, John the Revelator said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was also no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall... The Bible talks about a lot about what heaven is, but it talks almost even more about what heaven is not. Look at, look at this list. And God will wipe himself, will wipe away, uh, or God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. Does that not sound familiar when Jesus won our victory on the cross? What did he say? It is finished. And now for all of eternity, he cries out, It is done. These are the words of the King of Jesus. Verse 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the, of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall, be, shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Please bow with me in prayer. And Heavenly Father, we have, as it talks about in Ephesians, uh, already sat and stood and sang together in heavenly places. We have, we have already tasted uh, morsels of heaven this morning, just experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place through adoration and and magnifying your name, which is above every name. Crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So Lord, today, I pray you would stimulate that you would, 
You would awaken our senses, our minds, our eyes, our hearts, our belief, deepen our trust and in the reality of a real eternal hell and a real, thank you God, eternal heaven where we have an opportunity to be with you because you will be with us. So help us, Jesus, not to take this lightly, uh, not just to check mark Sunday that we went to church, but that today we will grow. As, as your scripture in, instructs us in Colossians to be rooted and grounded in the word of God and to grow in the knowledge of God in order that we can go out and be better more holy imitators of you and allow your presence in our lives to influence this, this dark world. Help us, Jesus, today, please, to, to care, not just about our bills and our cars and our houses. For, for you said all those things, all the material things are wood, hay, and stubble. One day they're going to be burnt up. But, but what really matters, what, what echoes in eternity is, is the spiritual, the souls of our, our children, of our grandchildren, of our husbands, our wives, our co-workers. So help us, Lord, today to be able to see, have eyes of faith, Lord, that can see what is not visible and trust you uh, for what is to come. And we cry out with Revelation 22, even so, even so, come Lord Jesus. And may that desire uh, grow in our hearts today as we learn about what you are preparing for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as I told you last Sunday, hell and the lake of fire are not the same place, but they represent the same ultimate reality, which is God's punishment, wrath, and judgment on sin and an eternity for forever separated from the presence of God. And if you die lost without Christ and you do not repent of your sins and trust Jesus to save you, you will go to hell and then eventually you will be cast into the lake of fire with Satan and his demons and the Antichrist. Also, the current heaven, which Jesus is continually preparing for us, is not the same Location as the new heaven and the new earth that will also be in the future. However, similarly to last Sunday, when I speak of heaven today or the scriptures I reference, whether I'm speaking of the current heaven or the new heaven and the new earth which will come in the future, it represents the same ultimate reality which is living in and with God's presence, worshiping and serving Christ, and actively fulfilling God's eternal purposes while experiencing His joy and His peace for all eternity. I shared this timeline last week, and I want to I invest the time because I think it's important that you understand. This is from gotquestions.org, a reputable Christian website with a lot of helpful information that I reference, Pastor Gary references, I believe it's biblically accurate, and um, you, can, you can follow it as well. But this is one of the, the uh, tools they use in regards to eschatology, which is the study of end times and eternity. And um, we would align uh, at the church at Chapel Hill here with this uh, record and this um, timeline of history and of eternity. Got Questions Ministries takes a pre-tribulational approach to eschatology. From that perspective, here is the order of end times events that the Bible reveals. The rapture of the church. Christ comes in the clouds to snatch away all those who trust in Him. The dead in Christ will be resurrected and taken to heaven too. From our perspective today, this is the next event in the eschatological timeline. The rapture is imminent. No other biblical prophecy needs to be fulfilled before the rapture happens. Rise of the Antichrist After the church is taken out of the way, a satanically empowered man will gain worldwide control with promises of peace. He will be aided by another man called the False Prophet, who heads up a religious system that requires worship of the Antichrist. 
the tribulation, a period of seven years in which God's judgment is poured out on sinful humanity. The Antichrist's rise to power is associated with this time period. During the tribulation on earth, the church will be in heaven. The Battle of Gog and Magog In the first part of the tribulation, a great army from the north, in alliance with several other countries from the Middle East and Africa, attacks Israel and is defeated by God's supernatural intervention. The Abomination of Desolation At the midway point in the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel and Jews scatter, and many turn to Jesus as their Savior. A great persecution breaks out against all those who believe in Christ. The Battle of Armageddon At the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns with the armies of heaven, saves Jerusalem from annihilation, and defeats the armies aligned with the Antichrist. The Antichrist and the false prophet are captured and thrown alive into the lake of fire. The Judgment of the Nations Christ will judge the survivors of the tribulation, separating the righteous from the wicked, as sheep and goats. It is thought that at this time the Old Testament saints will be raised from the dead, the righteous will enter the millennial kingdom, the wicked will be cast into hell. The Binding of Satan Satan will be bound and held in a bottomless pit for the next 1,000 years. The Millennial Kingdom Jesus himself will rule the world and Jerusalem will be the capital. This will be a thousand year period of peace and prosperity on earth. Memorial sacrifices will be offered in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. The Last Battle At the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison for a short time. He will deceive the nations once again and there will be a rebellion against the Lord that will be quickly defeated. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire, never to reappear. The Great White Throne Judgment All those in hell will be brought forth, and all the wicked from all eras of history will be resurrected to stand before God in a final judgment. The verdicts are read, and all of sinful humanity is cast into the lake of fire. The New Creation God completely remakes the heavens and the earth. It is at this time that God wipes away all tears and there will be no more pain, death, or sorrow. The New Jerusalem descends from heaven and the children of God will enjoy eternity with Him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is speaking... And he says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And notice what he says here. I go to prepare a place for you. In the original language, that that word stands for location, a physical place. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, where Jesus is, there you may be also. So first I want you to see the reality of heaven. Jesus believed and taught and preached that heaven, like hell, is a real, physical, literal place and not just a state of mind. Alistair Begg said this, and it is helpful, and it's been my prayer for you this week. He said, we've got a sneaking suspicion that what we've got now, this side of death, is actually better than what God has for us then on the other side of death. So, we want to hang on to what we've got. But instead, we need to believe, really believe, that these things are true. And Jesus said, someday there is going to be a melding together, a marrying and uniting together of the spiritual and the physical, of the unseen with the seen, of the material with the immaterial, of the heavenly with the earthly, of time with eternity, the the melding together of humanity with angels, and the coming together of Jesus and his bride, the church. It is reality. It is going to happen. And uh, it's, it's reality. And Jesus taught it. He believed it. Second is the reports of heaven. If you have your Bible open to Revelation 21, just go over to the next chapter. And let's see some reports, what God has to say about what He is and will create. Revelation 22 verse 1. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, 
clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Ooh, we haven't seen that in a while. It's going to be back. The tree of life that Adam and Eve unlawfully ate from, it's coming back. It says, and in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. They shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. There shall be no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. For Christ followers, everything we know about heaven comes from the Bible. We've just read Revelation 4. 21, 22, and and all throughout the other chapters, there's multiple references of the reality and the reports of heaven. But for many of us, especially in America, our imaginations have been influenced and shaped by extra-biblical ideas and sources that have distorted our understanding of what heaven really is like. For example, during the 14 and 1500s, much of society adopted what I would call a stained glass mythology or a renaissance theology uh, or eschatology where people sat in church on a Saturday or a Sunday morning bored out of their gourd by the priest or by the pastor's message. I hope that's not what you're experiencing this morning. And, and they, they look up at these, these magnificent stained glass windows, or, or maybe, maybe in the Catholic churches they looked at these, these pieces of artwork on the ceiling, and their minds begin to, to just imagine all of these things that, that aren't even biblical. And... We begin to adopt this idea that that heaven is like us floating in the clouds. How many pictures have you seen of of people or or angels or or just floating in the clouds, you know? White, white light. Um, And we begin to imagine heaven as surrounded by Cupid-like, pudgy, naked toddler angels Uh, with curly hair and little stubby fluttering wings, holding miniature long bows, shooting heart-shaped arrows out into eternity. What? Where did you get that? (laughs) Hallmark. Yeah, exactly. Um, Precious moments. Uh, Clearly, that kind of, of imagination and even nonsense... Um, is not going to convince sinful man that he needs to repent and trust Christ to save him and take him to that kind of a paradise. That doesn't, uh, that's not appealing, doesn't work. It's a distraction oftentimes for people to talk about that kind of a paradise. For Americans, we've adopted a Hollywood spiritualism uh, view of the afterlife where not only does everyone go to heaven, which is not true, but, but it's, a, it's a mesh of any and all kinds of religions. All roads lead to heaven, they would say. Um, the Pope even just said that recently, by the way. Many roads. By the way, the Bible says in the Gospel of John, Jesus said this of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So there's only actually one way, Pope Francis but, but we come up with these, these weird, make-believe, unbiblical fairy tales um, of either nirvana <laughs> or um, the promised land or the city of light, as we talked about last Sunday, even purgatory, kind of a, a, not a real welcome place, but it will eventually get you to heaven. Um, we come up with these man-made ideas and we talk about the man upstairs or, or my homeboy Jesus which is, don't do that. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. They, you have no business wearing a white t-shirt with a made-up face of Jesus that says, Jesus is my homeboy. Uh, don't, don't do not do 
do that. So we come up, but see, if you have a homeboy Jesus, he's a lot easier to deal with when you're confronted with your sin. So, so don't do that. Um, we come up with the man upstairs, these analogies to kind of lessen the, the holiness, the importance, the reality of, of an eternal God. Or, or we kind of dumb them down with, with pictures in the movies of an old, white-haired, decrepit, uh, wrinkled God who is male or female or, um, or black or white or non-binary. Take your pick. It's just like whatever, whatever you want God to be, that's what He is to you. That's a Hollywood spiritualism view of the afterlife. And I would say, and I put myself in this category, that we've also been uh, wrongly influenced at times by faithful pastors who, who haven't helped much by picking one, cherry-picking one or two biblical elements or realities of heaven and kind of highlighting that as their, as their favorite um, idea or, or reality of heaven and then they'll, they'll say things, maybe for their whole ministry, they'll just kind of hit this theme of like, one of these days, I'm going to, I'm going to soak my feet in the river of life for a million years. Um, first, if you soak your feet in the river of life for a million years, do you know how pruney they're going to be? But in all seriousness, m making, trying to make heaven look like that for all of eternity, is that really going to appeal to these young people? That they're just going to be stuck in a perpetual, boring, uneventful church service for the rest of their life? Do you really think that, that um, kicking around tadpoles and a river for all of eternity is appealing to these young people? And that they're going to say, yeah, I want to pick heaven uh, over, over hell based on, on that reality. We just need to be careful that we, we, we're not trying to make heaven something that the Bible, the Bible gives us plenty, enough to believe what we need to believe when it comes to heaven. And I, I don't have a, uh, next week you're going to be preached to someone with a PhD um, in theology. I don't have a PhD in eschatology. Um, but I do have a, a B-I-B-L-E, and I have been given a B-R-I-A-N. Just making sure you're listening. But God has given to us His Word, and He's given to us, not Brian's, but brains. Okay? He's given to us minds to think, to comprehend, to, to ponder, to, to weigh out eternity. Ecclesiastes says that God has put eternity in the hearts of men. So you can rail against God all you want and call yourself an atheist, but there is this nagging reality in your heart, in your mind, knowing that there's a real God. So, so heaven and hell... It's real, and God, God has, is not going to reveal everything to us, but, but He gives us plenty to be able to understand and comprehend. So let's look at some of these uh, reports of heaven. And I want you to think, um, we are limited in what we can understand about eternity, but I would ask you, as we walk through the Scriptures, to just allow them to help you think about the potential of what the new heaven and the new earth is beyond just floating in the clouds or viewing heaven as one perpetual church service. And we will worship Christ for all of eternity, praise the Lord. And He is worthy of that. But heaven is much more than just one long church service. So let me remind you, contrast the reality of heaven with the reality of hell as we studied last week. And again, you can find all this information on our website, uh, on our podcast. But John 3.36 says, number one, that the report on hell is it is the destination for all who reject Christ. Second, hell is a place of torment, sorrow, regret, and confined isolation, solitary confinement, no fellowship, no friends. Uh, you will feel all and be all alone. Third, hell is a place burning with fire and brimstone or sulfur. Hell is a place of utter darkness, outer darkness. Five, hell is eternal, never ends, and hell is final and irreversible. 
And that is reality. But the good news of the gospel is, as this message title last Sunday was, you can go to hell. As you can see, this Sunday is you can go to heaven. And the good news of the gospel is, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you don't have to go to hell and you will go to heaven. So let's learn a little bit about it. First, heaven is the destination for all who receive Christ, living forever together with God. We just read it in Revelation 21 verse 3. It says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is what? With men, and He will dwell what? With them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. So we're going to be in the presence of God for all of eternity. That ought to excite you. Thank you. (laughs) Second, heaven is a place of unity, life, joy, health, peace, light, and freedom. Look again, we just read in Revelation 21 and 22, the beginning of those chapters says there's no separation, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, no old battles to fight, no guilt, no regret, no curse of sin, no night, no more captivity, no more defeat. Come on, you got to say amen to that. I mean, what's the old hymn? Pete, I was thinking of you this morning, Pete. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. And what a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace, when He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day! Glorious day that will be. (laughs) Oh, man. Amen. Amen. It's getting closer. Number three, in heaven there will be unending. I thought about you, Kristen, on this one. In heaven there will be unending unified friendship and fellowship with the family of God. Look at this. This might become Kristen's new memory verse. I looked and behold a great multitude. She's never going to run out of people to talk to. Which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. So Kristen is going to be able to talk to people from every part of the world for all of eternity, and it's going to take her all of eternity to get to know all of them. If you see somebody running down the streets of gold, it may not be because they're running to Jesus, but they're running from Kristen. Anyway, it's just a a thought. Just a thought. (laughs) Um... Look, I I had the privilege to go fly to Guatemala in March, thousands of miles away, meet Christ followers who love Jesus, speak different languages, worship in different ways than we do, have different, uh, 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 all kinds, just a different life. And yet we had this, we had this bond. We had this brotherhood. We, We had this we had this, this melding together, even though we're all these miles apart, because we know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Heaven. And, um, and so, so we're going to be able to be together, and that's a reality of heaven. And God's re- Word reports about it. Uh, fourth, in heaven we will be not... This is so exciting, and some of you really have wondered this. In heaven we will be known and know our family, friends, The saints and our Savior. We're going to know them for who they are, how God made them, what they look like, what their voice sounds like. We're going to know them for who God made them. When we are born on earth, God gives us an identity. A special physical appearance, a personality, unique gifts and talents, relationships, families, friends, all different and distinct. Not one and the same of all the billions of people born throughout history. 
Well, then we're going to go to heaven, the ultimate reality of what God has made and designed, and then all of a sudden we're going to turn into uh, unidentifiable beings or we're just a mass of copycats or lookalikes? No. No, we will be known and we will know for who each other is. In Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, uh, that we just read. It said, people of every nation, tribe, peoples, and tongues, they will be crying out, worthy is the Lamb, that's Jesus, who was slain to receive glory and honor and riches and power. We're going to know he was slain because even after his resurrected body came out of the grave, he still retained the, the scar in his side and the nail prints in his hands to identify that he was the risen Lord. So as I believe his casting crown says, there's only scars in heaven and they belong to the Lord Jesus. And we're going to, I believe, see those scars that God, uh, God's son Jesus retained in order for us to worship him for all of eternity for what he has done for our souls. So we're going to know Jesus, we're going to know one another. And I'll just give you a few examples and there's more, but in Matthew chapter 17 verses 3 and 4, it is the transfiguration of Christ. It is where his, his deity is also known with his humanity. And he's standing there shining and two guys show up, Moses and Elijah. And although they had been, they had died centuries before, the disciples were able to identify them and Jesus was able to share who they were by name and appearance after they had died in this life and were with the Lord. And so we're going to know each other as we were known. Luke 16 verses 19 through 31 of which we read last Sunday. The Bible talks about a, a literal person named Abraham and a real man named Lazarus and then identified the rich man and they were all of them had died, but all of them were recognizable in this true story that Jesus told about them in the afterlife between heaven and hell. And so they were known by their names and their identity. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 8 through 17, King Saul, you remember when the Witch of Endor, which is a really cool story, if you're a little bored in your devotions right now, uh, maybe change it up, read this story. By the way, God's Word is not boring, you just get distracted, but... Anyway, in this story, this witch shrieks out because she was a medium and she unintentionally brought forth Samuel, uh, the prophet of God. And when Saul recognized Samuel because Samuel was alive when Saul was alive and, and, and worked in Saul's life and with Saul, Saul, when Saul recognized Samuel, that witch shrieked out like you would hear in a movie because she realized who Samuel was, and Saul did as well, and uh, he was recognizable in the afterlife. And then again, the, the best person for this uh, reality is John chapter 20, verse 7. After Jesus died physically on the earth, on the cross, when he rose from the grave on Easter Sunday morning in his now glorified body, of which one day you and I will receive... In that scripture, John 27, he tells Thomas, who was doubting whether the Lord was really the Lord, he said, Thomas, put your hand in my side and, and, and your hands and the nail prints in my hands and, and believe. And Jesus, even after death, was fully identifiable. And what did, what did Thomas cry out in verse 8? He said, my Lord and my God. And he knew who Jesus was. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall know Him as He is. And so we're going to know Christ, and we're going to know one another because we're going to know Jesus uh, imagine God making Moses and Noah and Mary and Esther and the Apostle Paul and the disciples and their amazing role in God's redemptive plan for mankind is all purpose towards building God's eternal kingdom for all of time on earth. The objective is to build God's eternal kingdom. But then when we get to that eternal kingdom... No one can remember who's who, and we're just going to, as people like to say now, memory hole. 
the identities and, and the, the people that God used to build his kingdom? Of course not. We're going to know one another. Revelation 5.12 says, again, we're going to cry out, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Because we're going to know who Jesus is, we're going to remember what he's done, and what he's going to do for us for all eternity. Number five, the new, in the new heaven and new earth, there will be order, purpose, and productivity, and we will serve and work for the Lord and have responsibility. Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 through 5 is a picture that we just read a few moments ago of the Garden of Eden restored to its original design. The tree of life is back. And in verse 3, look what it says there. God's servants shall serve Him. So unless you get the idea that we're just going to be sitting around heaven for all of eternity, that's not reality. God, you, you just think about the purposes, the mandate, the great commission that God has given to us in this life to serve and work for the Lord. And then when we get to His perfect dwelling place, all of a sudden we're just, yeah, don't worry about it. We're good. Don't have anything to do. Of course not. We're going to serve the Lord in a sinless Perfect environment, but we are going to, and we're going to have a perfect balance. You and I, one of our biggest struggles is balancing between, between time, uh, our time between family and work and, 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 and all of the, the things, balancing our finances, balancing our relationship, all these things. But we're going to live in a perfect, sinless, balanced environment with the Lord, and we've got responsibility, and we've got jobs for us to do. He says we are going to serve him. So I want you to just think about what the Bible clearly says some of the details of the new heaven and the new earth are and consider what, now listen, don't walk out of here saying, well, our, our pastor added to scripture today. I'm not, I'm not adding to scripture. I want you to think. I want you to use your Brian. Based on what God has said to us in His Word about what will be present, what are some of the possibilities of what heaven is going to look like beyond just clouds and white light? Originally, God put man where? In a garden, right? Garden of Eden. To work it and to tend it. The work that God, God designed men and women to work. Not by the sweat of their brow, but the labor was, was um, desired. The labor was good. The labor was, was something that work is something that God created. So they worked it and they tended it. And I was thinking a lot about my father-in-law this, this week. He's getting ready to make a lot of dust on my house by harvesting the crops. What do you get? So you got a garden. What do you get with farming and agriculture? What does that require? What does that involve? To, to, to have a garden, to have farming, to have agriculture, you have to have uh, people, workers, tools, equipment, sowing, planting, reaping, harvesting, storage, barns, buildings. In the new heaven, it says there is a temple. Now just think about all of the goings on of this tabernacle, of this sanctuary, of this temple, of this house of the Lord. Think about all of the service and the, the, the movement of this place to carry out God's plan on an earthly context. But the Bible says that there is going to be a temple in heaven where we will serve him. And what's in a temple? What does that require? Roles and responsibilities. Uh, in the Old Testament, you, you just do a study of all of the, the roles and the work that those people did. And then in the New Testament, people to take care of the daily tasks and duties, singers, leaders, servants, teachers, a common mission, teamwork. We're not going to be bored in heaven. We're going to have things to serve the Lord with. Also, the new heaven and the new earth, it talks about there's a father with his children, a husband with his bride, a shepherd with his sheep, Brothers with their sisters. What is that? A family. What does it take to have a family? 
What involves family? Love, fellowship, service, unity, memories, food, <laughs> parties, celebrations, housing, clothing, transportation, travel. You, you, you think that God has given us this magnificent earth and then one of these days he's going to remake it. I, I be, I'm, I'm completely honest with you. I get disappointed sometimes seeing these pictures and knowing that more than likely I won't make it there in this life. But I'm going to tell you what brings me great calm and honestly confidence is whatever God created for this life on this earth, whatever he creates next is going to be far superior and magnificent. So I may never get to Africa, but I'm telling you, I'm going to see the magnificent, mighty creation of God and whatever he's made now, it's going to be even better. And I believe in that reality that we're going to be able to see and experience even far better than we do now. Some of you have never been out of the state of Ohio. It's all right. It's all right. God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And don't, don't limit heaven for what it's going to be. Also, and this is just one more, um, in heaven and the new, in the new heaven and new earth, there is a king and his subjects, a creator with his creation, and a God with his, with his people. Um, what is that? A kingdom. It is a kingdom. What involves a kingdom? Worship, adoration, submission, service, authority, majesty, power, and glory. The glory of Almighty God. How beautiful, as the old hymn says, heaven must be. You've got agriculture. You've got family. You've got a temple. You've got a king and a kingdom. Heaven is going to be awesome. You can take God's word for what he says. Now, some of you may be referencing 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. says, whoa, ho, ho, ho. Don't be trying to stretch our minds because the Bible says, Eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's true. We are limited in our understanding. But if you just read the rest of the, of the verse, it says, But... God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So God has given to us His Word and His Holy Spirit to, to allow us, to enable us to be able to not fully understand everything. But man, think we can understand that, that heaven is more than baby toddler angels shooting airboats. Okay? Um, the Bible clearly describes mind-blowing, and we, we didn't go there today, and you study that on your own time, but you study heaven for the spiritual side of it that we cannot currently see, but one day we will, and our faith will become sight, and, and the, 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 the angels, and the beasts full of eyes, and the throne room, and all of it, it's going to be magnificent. You study that on your own time. But God is going to bring these married together of some of what we know and much of what we do not. And it, God is going to employ and redeem uh, much of the good gifts that He has purposed and given to us in this life. Only it will be in a perfect, sinless new earth. Um, Michael Whitmer said this, God did not say, I am making new everything, but rather I am making everything new. That's helpful. He does not promise to make new things to furnish the earth, but to renew the things that are already here. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, 21 and 22, creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And then Robert Jeffress said this, some people think heaven is in some galaxy far, far away, but the Bible teaches that the eternal dwelling place, the new heaven and new earth for Christians will be a recreated earth. God is just as intent on reclaiming a sinful earth as he is in reaching sinful mankind. So it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Two more, we're done. Number six, heaven is a place of absolute, total, final, eternal victory. Revelation 21 verses 5 and 6 says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, It is done. I'm the beginning and the end. 
And no more defeat, church family. No more canceling. No more fake news. No more, no more woke ideology. We are going to be victors because Romans chapter 8 says we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. Bottom line is, we win. We win, all right? No matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens tomorrow, no matter what happens the second Tuesday of November, no matter what happens in 2045, we are going to know absolute, total, final, eternal, eternal victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the highlight, the pinnacle, the glory of heaven is this. It's going to be perfect praise and worship for King Jesus, and it will proceed without end. Revelation 19, verse 4 through 6 says, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you His servants and those who fear Him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings hollering out, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And all of God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He is worthy. He is the Lamb who was slain. I'll just tell you this morning, I'm excited about heaven. Preaching on hell is hard. Preaching, studying for heaven is hard. But preaching on heaven, I found out, is exciting. And I'm grateful for it. So... I ask you this morning, what's your response to heaven? You have the reality of heaven, the reports of heaven. What's your response to heaven? Matthew chapter 3 verses 2 and 3 says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When John the Baptist was preparing for Jesus he was getting ready to look at him and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And his message was this, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Prepare your hearts. Prepare your families for the way of the Lord. And Revelation 22 verse 17 says, Let him who thirsts come, whoever desires anyone. John 3 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. So if you want that water where you'll never thirst again, let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. I'd ask you to stand this morning and ask the praise team to come. And I want to give you an opportunity to repent and be saved. Make yourself ready. Heaven is right around the corner. I'd ask you just to bow this morning. And I would ask you, have you repented of your sins? As Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that this morning? And with heads bowed, is there anyone here today who says, pray for me? I do not have security. I do not have confidence that I know Christ is my Savior. And if I die today, I do not know. I do not have assurance that I would go to heaven. And in the gospel of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, or, or the, the epistles of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he uses this word K-N-O-W. And he said these things over and over and over again. He says, no. And God tells you these things I have written in the scriptures that you may know that you have eternal life. So I asked you this morning, do you know, do you know that you have eternal life? And if you don't, no one's looking around, but would you just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I need Christ to save me. I need that water of life. I need to be saved. Anyone here this morning, just raise your hand. Be courageous and say, pray for me. I do not know Christ is my Savior. Anyone, I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else say, I want to I I receive Christ today. Anyone else? Say, I want to go to heaven. And I want to pray a prayer with you. I want to pray a prayer with you. We're all going to say it together, but I, I want you to pray this. This isn't a magical prayer. This isn't a mystical prayer. 
This is a prayer of saying, I am trusting Christ, God's Son, to save me by His death on the cross and His resurrection from the grave. I believe it. I believe it. I accept it. And I want to begin having a new life and following Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And if you raised your hand this morning, I want you to pray. And we're all going to pray together a very simple prayer, a confession that you're trusting Christ as your Savior. Would you please all repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe you were buried and rose again. I trust in you by faith, Jesus, to be my Savior and my Lord. I will obey you. I will follow you. I will live for you. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Now if you prayed that prayer, we're going to sing now the same song that we sang, Revelation song. Holy, holy, holy. And that's going to be, and it now is, your new testimony, your new story. If you prayed that prayer and you trusted Christ to become your Savior and Lord, your new eternal destination is heaven. And if you prayed that prayer... You don't have to do this, but I would love for you to do this. While you're singing, come meet me down here and just say, I gave my life to Christ. I'd love to shake your hand. And if you don't do that, find me after service. But please, please let it be known. Because Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. If you gave your life to Christ this morning, you have nothing to be ashamed of. And so this morning as we sing... Sing with conviction and with gratitude of our great God, who for those of us who know Christ is going to take us home to heaven one day. Amen? Let's sing together this morning. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
This is one of those Sundays when you don't want it to end, That's right. but we will. And thank you for being here today. Listen, we'll, sh- we'll be able to share more in the days to come, but uh, at least one has come today to make a profession of faith to say, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. So um, praise the Lord. My challenge to you is go out there knowing the reality of heaven, and let it, let it enable you to be a better, more faithful, more bold ambassador for heaven. 
and let's win this community for Christ. Um, just so delighted to have you this morning. Thank you for your patience. This is a little longer than normal, but uh, I believe God's word is worth it. So we love you. Greet one another. You're dismissed.